Hi everybody, five, six. We are literally one week away from essentially one week in a day from our DBQ. So um, how are you guys feeling at this point? You feeling like you have a decent grasp? You, you feel like- I feel like I have a decent grasp. So, you know, go ahead. Oh, that's all I got. That's all I got to say. Well, somebody else jumped in there. I think that was Zan. What were you going to say, Zan? I was just saying I feel the same way. Good. Good. And you know what? I mean, more than anything, you guys know the material. It's just, can you get it out in an efficient manner and really in 35 minutes? So that's where you really, over the next couple of days, need to practice a couple of things and what I would suggest, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Let's see if I can get it to, that's not the one I wanted. And, sorry, I'm trying to find my screen that I want to use. Give me one moment. I'm still kind of an idiot. No, I don't want to minimize this while I'm recording. Okay, I'll just go here. I'm going to share this, and actually, I'm going to delete that. There you go. Delete that. Sorry, I got too many tabs open, as I usually do. This is bad That's teaching. Okay. I, should be, I should be perfect. Oh, there's great adjustments. All right. So, uh, so let's just do this. I'm going to pull this over. So, uh, let me stop share here, and I'm going to share it again. Hi, Miss Miller. Okay. So let me go here. All right. Does everybody see our our homepage here? Yeah. Our maroon and gray. Okay. Yeah. So, so you should be on our main page here, 5620 DBQ doc analysis outside evidence. Mm hmm Good. All right, so as we talked about on Monday, here's the stuff that you need to go through. Uh, most people, or a lot of people have done this. It's real simple, you're just logging into your My AP. If you struggle and you cannot figure out what your um, um, My AP, let's see, what your uh, AP ID is, I can help you with that but you can find that within my AP. Uh, it should be like a seven or eight digit number. And like I said, I can help you guys find that if you need to. Make sure you check your tech okay. or your tech. Uh, make sure you understand specifically what, which ones you're gonna use. You're gonna use your Chromebook, you're gonna use a desktop, you're gonna use your phone, it does not matter. Um, so kind of walk through the exam demo, make sure you can submit. Okay, we just wanna make sure that that's that's up and working and then all i'm asking you to do is just to tell me here that you um you've done that okay real real simple uh this is the video that kind of walks you through um what the exam will kind of look like here is heimler of course going through the same thing so you can really use either one of those so that's one thing i just want to make sure that everybody's good to go um, yeah and again um Really what I'm, I'm finding to be the most important stuff is are these last couple assignments that we've kind of been working on, whether it is uh, making sure that you're using documents to support your argument, make sure you're understanding or being able to describe your documents. So today what I'd like to look at is how are you going to be able to do a HIP and include outside evidence? And then the last thing I'm going to give you is a DBQ over the coronavirus. Just try to do something kind of way out of bounds just to see if you can get the basic format down. So this is what, what we'll kind of be looking at here today. Um, okay. Again, if you have not done it, I would highly suggest you, you download this uh, DBQ worksheet um, and practice a, a DBQ with Heimler. He will walk you through it. He'll write down how he interprets it. And then when you feel like you've kind of broken it down in the notes, 
he's going to show you what a couple of different essays look like. So when, mm -hmm. you, uh, so you can download these right here. Are you sure you want to leave? Uh, yes. I don't know why that does that. Oh, that's because it's his. Come on. There we go. So these are kind of what he's, these are the different essays and you can kind of see. So for example, here's what a 10 out of 10 looks like. Here's what a six out of 10 looks like. And here's what a two out of 10 looks like. And I'm here to tell you every single one of you can at least do a six. A six will get you a passing score. Mm -hmm. So make sure then you're kind of going through. Uh, I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. How, how, um, Heimler does a really good job of really making it clear, like the difference between really good ones, average ones, and really poor ones. So again, if you ever want to kind of go over this together, all you got to do is reach out. We'll come together on a time and, and we can do this together. So here's all our skill reviews. You guys have been doing a really good job on those. What I'd like to do is kind of look at a couple of examples here from last class. Um, I'm going to pull one up here real quick. Let's just see. Using evidence beyond the docs. I want that one gone. Let's see. So let's, let's look at this one. Can you guys see the, the one I just pulled up? It says exploring document based questions. No. Okay. So I need, let me share that. Uh, come on. Uh, share screen. Okay. So what our goal here was, and this is a student example here. What our goal was, was to try to take two documents and to incorporate them into an argument. Okay. So if we go back to the example here, and this is actually taken from an AP world history one. So again, all you're doing is looking at the format. What is done here is this. So your statement of what you're gonna be arguing is more than likely gonna be your first statement. And so you can see it's like, when governments promoted their own state-sponsored visions of industrialization, it frequently led to a major increase in the size of the economy. There is your statement. That's your claim. Now, how are those documents going to help argue your point? So when I look at, um, when I look at, uh, what did I do here? Uh, oh, oh, the pages go that way. I'm such an idiot. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you don't have to agree that quickly. Let's see, I just don't want four pages. Oh, well. All right. So here's our two documents. Both of them, one of them talks about how Russia increased its economy by how much it produced, the, the fact that it produced much more than it did before industrialization. That's a pretty obvious point. Uh, we see how in Japan, after industrialization, they, um, their economy improved a lot. So what we, what we can see, if I go back over here to the original uh, paragraph, we can see how these documents are used. In Russia specifically, their industrialization led to a huge increase. Dot, dot, dot. Notice I'm including specific information from the doc. I do not need to quote it. The fact that I, at the end of the sentence, I put in parentheses document three, that basically says I am summarizing, I'm paraphrasing what that document includes. So we can see mm -hmm. document three, document seven here. So when this was written, I can clearly see these two documents are supporting the original statement. Okay, so let's kind of go down and let's just look at, at one here, hold on. Okay, so let's, let's look at this first one here. So evaluate the relative importance of different causes for the changes of a national identity. A lot of people struggled with this idea of what is national identity. So what do you guys think? What is national identity? Uh, national identity is the way how you represent one another, especially as a nation. Okay, so it's kind of how I view myself as a member of that nation, exactly. So how do I view myself as an American? So how did Americans begin to view themselves throughout the history? If you remember in the beginning, 
we were 13 different colonies, we had 13 different ideas of what the nation could be. As time progresses then, what we begin to see is that Americans begin to see themselves more as an American and not necessarily as a citizen of Virginia or a citizen of- So mostly uh, white patriotism? It, patriotism certainly is a part of it. Yeah, our national identity today is based around our attachment to our flag. So most definitely patriotism can be an answer. Uh, okay. <laughs> So when I look at this, I'm looking for different causes for the changes in national identity. So what caused Americans to change their view of their own country? And so mm -hmm. the first one we see is, and we've talked about this many times, this is actually from a response to the War of 1812. We begin to see American, you know, the, the statement on here, we owe no allegiance to no crown, or we owe allegiance to no crown, meaning we are not tied to a monarchy we are not tied to another country we are free we are we have our own country now uh, and you don't have a king correct correct the second one talks about john o'sullivan begins to talk about um the destiny of our country so we begin to look at this sort of growing connection between what it is to be an American and the fact that we are a special people. We really view ourselves throughout history as being very different from everyone else. So as we begin to tie these two together, so this student, what we begin to see is a decent explanation, but what I want you to be careful of is make sure you have a first, your first sentence should be a really strong statement on what your claim is. In this case, mm -hmm. the student said, these two documents both argue that there were great changes in American national identity that have an impact on America today, such as a change in politics, religion, and technology. My only issue with those, so those are three solid claims. My only issue is you actually have three claims here, and what these three claims are doing is it kind of begins to muddle it up. My suggestion is pick one of these whether you're talking about politics, whether you're talking about religion, or you're talking about technology, just talk about one of them. Okay, so that's gonna be very important. So here we can see document one shows a man holding American flag after America became independent from Great Britain, good. I would have liked that they said something about after the war of 1812, but that's okay. Um, my only issue is how does this person's, the student's explanation of document one, does it help to support this student's claim? It shows a man holding an American flag after America became independent from Great Britain. Does that support a claim in politics, religion, or technology? Uh, can you say it one more time? Yeah, so how does the student statement about document one, does it support any one of these claims, politics, religion, or technology? Uh, wait, can you say um, what the student said one more time about the Britain, something like that? Yeah, can you not see it right now? Actually, let me look at it. Shows a man holding up a flag, shows independent. Um, my best guess would have to be, uh, maybe political. I would agree. I would agree. Does anybody else want to argue anything else? All right. Um, yeah, so this is where I would probably, as a student, I would make sure I tie this in politically. Don't make the reader guess. So he says, document one shows a man holding up an American flag um, after America became independent from Great Britain. America became politically independent from Great Britain. So just by throwing in politically in front of independent immediately ties that into the claim. But I would have to say, how does this show independence? So maybe you're talking about the fact that it says we owe no allegiance or we owe allegiance to no crown. That statement alone would help to support that argument. Let's look at the second one. America was able to grasp what it was and define who they were. The title of document two is the great nation of 
futurity, meaning America is a nation that states that everyone has an equal share, meaning women now have, see, this one is a much better one that ties into what the claim is. But no, uh, they, are they talking about politics? What are they talking about here? So states that everyone has an equal share, meaning women now have the same rights that men do. If we talk about women having the same rights, is that political, is that religious, or is that technological? Um, have the same rights as men. I say political. That's political as well. So that's why I would say when we see a statement like politics, religion, and technology, just stick with one. One is fine. Mm -hmm. Your other claim could be religion. Your other claim could be technology. But this claim and these two documents are helping to support political change, mm -hmm. political causes. Okay. So, I mean, overall, this is pretty good. Uh, I don't know. I would think that this might get a point, but it needs to much more specifically look at politics. All right, let me pull up another one here. Uh, I think it's this one. Pull this over. And let's just see the same thing. So I'm going to stop the share here. I'm going to go back to share and we're going to go here. All right. So can everybody see now uh, a different one? It has the red yes. box here. Okay. So it's exactly the same. So let's look at this students. From the period 1800 to 1860, the United States gaining its independence was more important than its mission to assimilate others since they were the first to step away from monarchies and govern as people. The nation felt the need to assimilate and convert others to a democracy. What's your guys thought on that one? Um, Immediately something's missing. I say the things he's missing is uh, the document, why it does attach to his claim. I, I would agree. The number one thing I'm missing is I don't know which documents you're talking about. So yeah. if we're talking about step away from monarchies, maybe here I would want to do, want to put document one. Government mm -hmm. as people, the nation felt the need to assimilate. There's document two. Now what's missing though is how those two documents tie back to what the claim is okay so mm -hmm. it's, it's close but you got to mention what document you're talking about and how those documents support your claim so in this mm -hmm. case this one is not doing it as well let's look at another one here here's number three evaluate the extent change in goals strategy and accomplishments of african-american rights between this time period and as we look from the period of 1865 to 1945, the goal strategy and complement or accomplishments of the American Civil Rights Movement increased dramatically, good, from gaining basic rights with the help of abolitionists to being able to exercise their freedom with the help of civil rights activists. Now, again, I can see the two different documents, but they are not mentioned. So we got to make sure that we are, are including document one and document five, just like what we did up here where we are identifying what it is we're talking about. You have to identify what document you're mentioning. Okay? Right. So that's what these are kind of missing. A very strong claim and then identifying what docs support that claim. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's how those can be improved tremendously. So they're close. We just have to take that next step. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So questions over that? No, sir. I got one it says no. Anybody else? No. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, sorry. Let's go ahead here and I'm gonna go ahead and share back out uh, where are these? Here we go. I'm gonna go and share this back out. Okay, so now we are back on our agenda page. Mm -hmm. 
So now that was the one we were just worked on using the documents to support an argument. If you need some additional uh, help, if I'm not explaining it very well, feel free to, to watch what Heimler does and how he argues with documents. He does a really good job on this. What I want you to kind of look at today is now how do we include a HIP analysis and outside evidence? So if we click on this, and again, we're using the same questions over and over. So they should be fairly uh, apparent. So what we're gonna mm -hmm. do is we're gonna try to analyze the documents using HIP. And that last O just kind of means outside evidence. So I wouldn't worry about that just yet. But what you're gonna do is just like we've done with any HIP analysis, you are gonna analyze one document using HIP or you're gonna analyze the document using HIP. Remember, you only have to use one of these and then include an outside piece of information. So how it's gonna kind of look like is, so here's some sample sentences. These are some templates you can use. Um, so what we're kind of looking at here is, how do we begin to incorporate this, okay? So this one deals, this one's Charles Morris, an American lawyer, former banker. Let's see what the question is. Evaluate the effects of various strategies implemented by governments promoting their own state-sponsored visions of industrialization. So we're still talking about industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the period from 1750 to 1900. Uh, oh dear, somebody's letting their dog poop in my yard. All right, I'm gonna have to go ahead and hurt them. And it's just one of those little tiny dogs too that just leave little little poop bombs everywhere that you can never see. All right, so this talks about uh, the growth of like infrastructure, whether it's the Erie Canal, whether it's roads. So this specifically is dealing with uh, kind of the first American Industrial Revolution, uh, the Market Revolution. If we if we want to be more specific, but it's talking about canal building, it's talking about railroads, it's talking about connecting the different parts of the country, okay? So as a point of view, here's how we would wanna kind of argue this. So as a banker, because we're looking up here, Charles Morris was a former banker. As a banker, the author's point of view in document six is that he's focused on the positive effects of industrialization very important phrase there because he's talking about how good industrialization is, such as profit-driven nature of such ventures, such as taking out bank loans for infrastructure. This is shown by commending the building of bridges to increase commerce. So all we're doing is as a banker, the author has a very good understanding of how bank loans can affect industrialization. Companies need money to expand, they will get a loan from the bank. That loan then will help them increase their reach. And so we wanna make sure that we were kind of talking about this. This is a little bit wordy. I don't necessarily like how it's written, but it works. They're outside information. What they're doing is they're adding in what information do they know about this that wasn't included in the docs. And in this case, what we start to see is that um, in Germany, not only did they, did the bank loans help with infrastructure, but once these, once these companies started getting going, they started to support the workers a little bit more. Um, so they began to, we know, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, Germany started to increase industrially and then, and then eventually they start to implement new policies that help the workers, whether it's better working conditions, whether it's uh, better wages, whatever. Uh, we also see Japan's Meiji government provided government subsidies, which, which means they provided like uh, money to family owned businesses to help them grow. So what we begin to see then when we try to throw together these different uh, arguments so you can see here's the claim, here's the discussion of the claim using the document, and then we start to see how like HIP analysis is thrown in there. 
Um, so claim, discussion of claim using the document, and now here's the HIP. Okay, so you can see here's here's what they initially wrote, and they said, however, the author is a former banker and lawyer. Titles the paper where the document seven comes from. Infrastructure is always a good thing. I'm not a big fan of using quotes, at, but you can use quotes as long as it's short and sweet, and as long as you explain that quote. As a former banker, uh, the author is likely only focusing on the positive effects of industrialization in this piece as it relates to the generating of more money for business banks and wealthy people. So he really sees as more money moves into society, that's going to help businesses banks, and other wealthy people who are like him. Um, when we want to throw in outside information, similarly, governments in other countries supported industrialization such as, German, such as Germany or Japan. So that is outside what is given to you in document seven. So what I'm going to ask that you try to do is do two things here. Okay, so here's your question. Same questions we've been seeing, same documents we've been seeing. So here's your document three now. So what I'd like for you to do is to choose which one works best for you, which one works best for the document. Not everyone's gonna be perfect, but use one of these that you know you can, you can easily do. If you're good at talking about historical context of a specific document, like what's going on around it, why this person is so interested in immigration, that's historical context. Who is he writing to? Who is he writing this for? Why is he writing it? That's the purpose. The purpose, the author is writing this because he wants to invoke what? Right? The author's purpose in writing this was to do what? Uh, he, sh he did this. Where in here are we seeing the evidence of him wanting to do this? So let's say the author's purpose in writing was to uh when number of foreigners come in here one may consider nearly equals the whole natural increase the white population such mass at, at the uh, have most important effects on the condition and the character of the people the moral and physical condition of these immigrants after ungoverment which are to be expected from settling in a foreign country is generally very much improved so what he's saying here and this is his piece he's saying immigration is a good thing it improves the lives of the immigrants. But is the country truly benefited this great foreign immigration? Have the people been wiser or happier? So he's talking more about the citizens. Are the immigrants making citizens happier and wiser? Uh, the prior year or two in advance will be very poor compensation if us uh, the forfeiture of freedom and the transfer of power to those who know how to use it wisely. So is he making a positive or negative statement? Is he supporting immigration or is he not? Supporting. Okay, so we can see supporting up top, but whenever you see the word but, that's always gonna tell you that, hey, it's this way, but here's what I really think. So whenever you see like a but, they're gonna take it in a, in a different direction. So I would actually say that this it has been said that without these foreigners, our railroads and canals could not have been constructed, but the progress of a year or two in advance would have been without foreign labor would be very poor compensation. It's offset by the corruption of manners, the forfeiture of freedom, and the transfer of power of those who do not use it wisely. So I would say overall that I think this is a, a negative statement that immigrants, they were needed, but not abs absolutely did we need them to be able to do what we were going to do in the United States? This one's a little tougher. Um, outside information, what else can we throw in there that we know that will help us in understanding how we argue this point? Again, if you have struggles, you can always go back to, sorry, I've got to pull this up here. Come on. Oh, I did not want that. Okay, so you can always go back to, if you're struggling with how to include outside evidence, he does a very good job with this. But again, all I really want you to do is to try your best to include as much outside uh, evidence as you can. 
Everybody can do a hip analysis. Everybody can do outside evidence. You do not have to do it exactly as we do it at the practices I've given you here. In fact, it can be a, a little bit shorter with 35 minutes. You're not going to have a ton of time. So you got to make your arguments clear, concise, and to the point. Um, what I, and, and those are really like extra points that we can be earning. Because if I go back up here to the rubrics and look, everyone in here can get a thesis point. Everyone can get a contextual point. Evidence is where you, we are now. We are describing what at least two docs have. That's going to be an easy point. And this is where you have two claims at least. If you only have one claim, or if you have two claims and you only use two documents, you can use one point. If you have two claims and you use four documents, you can get another point. Okay, so try to use all the documents if you can. Uh, the evidence beyond the doc, there's two extra points here. If you can come up with one piece of additional evidence in your whole essay, you can get one point. If you can you come up with two pieces of outside historical evidence, you can get another point. So these two points are actually kind of easy to get, but the reality is if you can just add in one, then we're already talking two, three, four, five points. As I've mentioned before, five points is gonna get you a passing score. Now this analysis and reasoning, this is where you're gonna throw in your HIP analysis. So for at least one document, explain why the document's point of view, purpose, or historical situation is relevant. So if I do one hip analysis, boom, I get a point. If I do a second hip analysis, I can get another point. So we've already talked about five points here. Even if I just do one hip analysis, there's going to put me at six points. That'll put me as a passing score. So, you know, keep that in mind. With your time, you're not going to be able to probably get all 10 points. But what you should try to do is kind of strategically write your essay so that you can maximize your point total. Five, <coughs> excuse me, five, six, seven points is going to be ideal for this essay. Anything you get above and beyond that, more power to you. Okay? So, so that's outside evidence. And then the last thing that I've included here is a practice DBQ. And so this is where I would like for you to do your best. Uh, to sit down, try to write an essay, time yourself, see if you can write a DBQ in 45 minutes or less. Remember, 10 minutes is going to be used for reading and annotating. So you'll want to make sure you have a timer, a watch, whether you put a timer on, you know, if you come up here and you just go timer, uh, 35 minutes, right? I can come right up here and get a, get a stopwatch going uh, for 35 minutes, but I got to stay tight on my time. I cannot emphasize that enough. Let me go back to this. I cannot emphasize that enough that you need to take 10 minutes to kind of pre-write pre and then 35 minutes to write. That only is going to give you five minutes at the end to submit your document. Okay, you can use either one of these planning sheets. This is the first one that we, we kind of used. If you're not comfortable with that one, then use Heimler's. Personally, as I've started to really work on this, I really like Heimler's version. Oh, I got AP World History, but it's the same one. Clearly, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, reusing these for the different classes because they're exactly the same. When we talk about AP histories, it's AP world, AP US, AP Europe, European history, uh, even government uh, and econ use this type of format. So whether it says AP world history, it doesn't really matter. Um, that's the one I would like. If you happen to have a printer at home, I would say print one of those out so you, you physically have a the sheet in front of you. Um, but what I would like for you to do is just try your best. Now, what is it about, what are we seeing with this one? This one happens to be AP World History. Uh, does not matter, it's exactly the same. But this is just a practice one. E evaluate <coughs> the extent to which COVID-19 has disrupted daily life around the world in 2020. So 
all we all I've done here is is created a question about this current time period, right? How has COVID-19 disrupted daily life around the world? And then remember, we're talking about the extent. Has it disrupted life a lot? Has it disrupted life a little bit? This first document we can see is a is a uh, announcement for Major League Baseball uh, shutting down their season. Uh, so we could talk about sports being disrupted. Here is a decree from the Italian Prime Minister's office. Uh, so society has been disrupted. Notice the different things that society has, uh, Italy in particular, how they close down their society from this time period. Uh, here's the coronavirus impact on stock markets, right? Let's say, oh, I don't know a lot about stock markets, but what can I tell about the stock market because of coronavirus. We know coronavirus first hits uh, around February 20th. That's when we start to see you know, China really struggling. So we can see that over time, the stock market has decreased exponentially. And in some cases, and again, I don't need to know how to read this too much, but I can say these stock markets have all declined because of coronavirus. If you remember about stock markets, one of the things we talked about is people want to buy parts of companies. They're willing to do it when things are good. When things are bad, they're going to take their money and they're going to kind of hoard it. They're going to, they're going to put it into gold. They're going to put it into cash it's because when banks start to struggle during stock market problems, uh, cash becomes a lot more difficult to get a hold of. And so in this regard, so think about in the United States, we have what, 30 million people who are unemployed. If 30 million people don't have the money to buy in the stock market, their confidence is way down. That's why stock markets decrease because money is not going into them. People are selling instead of buying, okay? Uh, if we look at document four, here's a statement from Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, meeting with airline CEOs. And what we begin to see here is that the risk of the average American contracting remains low. That's largely owing to the decision Mr. President suspense, owing to the tremendous cooperation in this industry, the airline, because addition to spending travel. So immediately we can see airline travel has been suspended. So that means movement of people has been disrupted. So people who have jobs where they need to travel a lot, they're unable to do that. Uh, document five is from the WHO, the World Health Organization. And these are his opening remarks. And this is where he talks about how societies are being disrupted. So overall, when I begin to discuss this, this question, evaluate the extent to which COVID-19 has disrupted daily life, I'm going to need to come up with two claims that support what I think did it disrupt life a lot or it did it not supply or disrupt life a lot. I'm going to say it disrupts life a lot. You guys have a first person experience on this. You know, your life has been incredible, incredibly disrupted. Um, so in this case, I'm going to come up with two claims. I will say it disrupted uh, entertainment worldwide, and it disrupted uh, movement within society. Which documents are going to support that? Okay. So again, this is one where I would just like for you to kind of practice a little bit when we, when we get together next week. What I'll do is I'll give you a couple of different uh, questions that we haven't seen before to let you practice one more time. Um, but this would be a very good one to be able to practice your technique, okay? So what I'm asking you to do is just submit uh, what you wrote and then also make sure you tell me how long it took you to write it. So if you wrote for 35 minutes and you got to this point, but then you feel like it wasn't finished, go ahead and finish, but make sure you have a line in there that says, this is where I was at the end of, of 45 minutes. Just all you're doing is kind of identifying, are you going to be able to make within that 35 minute time period? It's going to be tough. I'm telling you right now, 35 minutes to write is not easy. So that's why you really have to be smart in how you organize that first 10 minutes 
when you're reading and annotating on your um, on those documents. And that's where those note sheets really come in, in handy. So you don't have to keep going back into your documents. Okay. So questions. I, I kind of covered a lot of crap. I've I've gone ten minutes over, but um, questions on what I'm asking you to, you guys to do. So these are our two big things that I'm asking you to kind of practice on. This one's going to be tougher. I get that. If you feel like you know I'm not even going to touch outside evidence, I'm not even going to worry about that when I write my essay. That's fine. Just go ahead and move right into your practice DBQ and see what you can do with it. Okay. So questions you may have. Um, I got a question. Go. So on the um, that assignment we did on the, um, you know, for the two documents you posted, uh -huh. um, when, when we uh, get, um, damn, I'm trying to think about my question. Oh, so when you take a look at mine, uh, can you kind of give me a feedback if my statements were strong enough? Because, um, I feel like I did well enough, but I feel like the statements I made, especially when I tied the two documents to the claim, I feel like it wasn't very broad enough. So when you go over it, can you kind of give me a, view, a feedback of what I, I need to do to make it better? I will. As soon as we get off this, I'll, I'll go in and, and look at yours specifically. Okay. And really, Thank all you much. guys that are on there today, I'll make sure that I know I've already done Zans. I haven't, I haven't looked at or seen Brent's, uh, Inesias or Charles's. So yeah, if you guys want to get that in, I'll look at those as well. Um, but I will, I will do that as soon as I'm done here. Thanks, sir. Anybody else? I don't have access to the document analysis and outside evidence one. What, what is it saying? That I need access in order to access it. You talking about this document here? Yes. One in here? Yes. So that's not giving you access? No. All right, let me change that. Uh, see, we have a new one here. All of a sudden this has changed, but I restricted who can open with change link. Let's see, anyone, that's what we want, so. I'll copy that and let me go back up in here. All right, hit refresh and see if you can get in now. I can. Okay. So they, they did, they've updated it. So now it, it may, I may have a couple of these that are bad since it's, it, I don't know. Anyway, um, any other questions? Uh, no, that's all I got. All right. So we're like one week away. How's everybody feel? Are they ready to go? I kind of I kind of feel nervous because also at the same time I'm also supposed to have a chemistry uh, ACP chemistry exam next week. Uh huh. So yeah, it's like I gotta like balance out my yeah. study settings that way I won't like fail neither because I, I actually want to pass both of them. I actually want to pass all my AP courses and ACP. So he, here's my suggestion because I know a couple students have like three, four, five AP classes tests that they're doing. So when you're studying, really work on setting up a time, like a schedule where you're going to say, okay, I'm going to study for 30 minutes on AP Chem or ACP Chem. I'm going to take 30 minutes and study A push. I'm going to take 30 minutes and study AP biology or whatever. So go on like a 30 minute rotation where you're not spending too long on one class but you're spending enough to where you can effectively work. And if you got to increase that to 45 minutes, that's fine or an hour, but it shouldn't ever be more than you're studying one class longer than like one hour. In fact, I would say cut it down to 30 minutes and just keep rotating your classes so that your mind stays fresh. 
in between your studying, take like a 10 minute break, go outside, play with the dog, play with the cat, you know, throw rocks at neighbors who are walking by, whatever you need to do for <laughs> 10 minutes, separate yourself, then go back and attack your next class. So short and sweet, have a nice schedule set up and try to stay to it and stay right. focused. Okay. Anybody else? Got it. And again, if you have specific questions, if you want to meet, so like, for example, Jaquan, if you want to, after this, we can, I can, we, you and I can just have a Zoom ourselves where I'm going through your, your answers with, with you and I both there. So. Okay. All right. I'm kind of ready for this to happen because I'm, I'm ready to maybe shave this. Oh. Uh. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to get a haircut already. Yeah. It, it, it my hair already grew a lot. It, it, it's like to a point where I can have dreadlocks, but I really don't want that. I just want a good cut. That's it. Yeah, I know. I know the feeling. Luckily, I got a haircut right before uh, coronavirus hit, so I got it cut real short. So it's starting to grow a little bit. Oh, uh, one more quick question. Uh, do you know when is the city county open? What do you mean? Like, um, let's say, oh, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to like say, but well, Marion they, County is one week behind the rest of the state. There's three areas in the state that have hot spots: Marion County, Lake County, and maybe Cass County. So there's three counties that are behind uh, the state uh, business rollout. You know, getting back so. Like Marion County is going to be one week behind. So when the governor says, hey, we're opening up on May 24th, Marion mm -hmm. County is still like a week behind. Okay. So I would just keep an eye on what, what the governor is saying. Oh, okay. Because um, the reason I asked that is because um, it, we have, me and my family have an ongoing situation right now. My mom's trying to like follow restraining orders. So she's trying to keep tabs with the news to see if any think like open that way we can get the situation out of the way right well the best thing to do is probably reach out to them via email or through a call initially and find out their hours mm -hmm. okay because more than likely all government offices are open a lot of the government workers are working from home mm -hmm. uh but they still can can take care and, and you know those bit those actions are not stopped so as long as you reach out to them and find out their times, you know, I don't, know, I, I don't have an answer to be honest. I would just, uh, that, that's okay. Okay. I, I would look, I would get online and look specifically at the office you need to contact and find out what times they're available for interaction with people. Mm -hmm. All right. That's fine. Uh, thank right. you though. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right. So good job. Uh, I will see you guys on Monday and then we'll be like four days away. Time going fast. You know what? It is what it is. Do your best. That's all you can do. And you hope for the best. You understand that students are under a lot of stress, but the people who are going to be reading your work are going to be under a lot of stress too. So I can imagine this is this is actually the best year to be taking an AP test because it's so, it's going to be so simple. It's not the three hour test that we're normally used to. It's only a 45 minute test. So I think right. in some ways there, the AP or the college board people will be a little, little lighter in how they grade is my, my thought. Right. I, I don't know that. All right. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this so I can get, get the recording up there. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I appreciate everybody showing up. Uh, you're welcome, sir. All right, see you guys. You too. Bye.